Hey community, welcome to church. My name is Malaya and this is my husband, Pastor Nick. Baby, we... baby, take a minute here. Let's just appreciate everyone that Malaya is wearing. You may not be able to see it. She's wearing denim on denim. Denim on denim. So I just wanted to give a special shout out to that because I just think that's, that's amazing. He's got a rock. And like, we've gotten pretty good at this whole intro of CPC Online <laughs> Church, don't, don't you think? If this is your first time here, let me just say, we, we, we've been doing this for a while now, and we're just so pumped that you decide to join us this Sunday morning. Sweet she doesn't honor. always wear denim on denim, but when she does, she looks fantastic. And uh, <laughs> we're just so excited that you decide to join us this morning at CPC. If this is your first time, again, we, just, we have a community card in the description of this video, and we want you to check that out, fill it out, because we want to get to know you. We really love connection here at CPC. What, what, what do we have coming up, baby? In the meantime, we are gonna get into a time of worship. Yes. We're gonna have Pastor Steve and his lovely wife, Jess, lead us yes. um, as into a worship experience. And so we invite you to join us. Jesus, thank you so much that we could come into your house this morning. I pray as we worship you, you would be honored and glorified and we pray as you taught us to pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, meet with us as we have desired to meet with you. We pray this in your strong name. Amen. Hallelujah.
There's a song in my soul And I feel it stirring in me This I know for sure That your love is like a flood And your mercy never ending I give my song to you There's a joy in my soul
God, thank you so much for meeting with us this morning in this time of worship. And God, we pray that you would just speak to us, Lord, throughout this service and throughout the rest of the day. God, we, we recognize, we acknowledge that you want to do something new, that you want to transform us, Lord God. We, we are just so thankful that we can continue to gather together all over Ottawa, wherever we are, just to bring you honor and glory. Yeah. God, would you be with Pastor Jeff as he speaks this morning? Yes, God. And just be with each and every person that is tuning into this video, this live stream, Lord God. We yeah. are so thankful for our family. Yeah. And God, would you just be with them, speak to them, and, and just show them your love, Lord God. Yes, God. We pray all of this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve and Jess, for leading us in worship. You guys always do such an incredible job. And I also love the split screen worship. It's just like two player game. Like it's just absolutely incredible. 
Anyways, we're gonna transition to our morning tithes and offerings. And so if you're wondering how you can give to our church, one of the ways is by clicking the description of this video, you will find a give link. And if you click that, it will redirect you to our church website where you can give online. We have a couple special announcements uh, in the meantime as you do that. Yeah, that's awesome. So I don't know if you guys have seen on our social media or you've heard through word of mouth, but we are currently reading through the book of John, 21 Days with Jesus Challenge. And if you've been reading along with us, we encourage you keep going. This challenge is going to be absolutely eye-opening and so insightful. We also encourage that if you haven't started, it's not too late, so join Never us. We are uh, posting each day on our social media, and that is a forum where you can share your thoughts, share your comments. We would love to hear from you. Well, please stay tuned for the rest of these announcements and get ready to hear one of the most coolest, awesome, this guy, like hit his vocal tone, his tone, his pitch, just an incredible voice, Pastor Jeff Hillier, right after these announcements. CPC family, just want to remind you that registration for VBS has opened, so make sure you head over to our website. Um, the first 100 kids that get registered, they will uh, get VBS in a box, which is a pretty awesome, exciting thing. It's customized for your kids. Um, they will have everything that they need for their craft, their games, instructions, candy, you name it, it will be in there. So make sure to go register so your kids do not miss out on that. Registration is open until July 26th, but I cannot guarantee that uh, those boxes will be there at that date. Plus, pickup is a little bit earlier. So go to your website, go to our website, and make sure to register. Send that link out to your neighbors, your friends, your family, anyone that wants to attend VBS. This is a great way to reach our community during this time. Friends, I don't know about you, but over the last 12, 13 weeks, I've found the rhythm of life completely changed. I find my days very busy with the work that I have to do here at the church, trying to make, make sure we navigate each transition that takes place according to our government. But it's my, my personal life that's really taken the biggest adjustment. It, you see, I'm an extrovert who loves adventure, and normally Ainsley and I would have, be hanging out with friends constantly, or we would be exploring our city, or we would be on hikes, or, 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 or some kind of adventure together. But I found myself doing things a little differently at nighttime. I find our, myself playing games more, find myself reading more, paying more attention to TV, and repeating that day after day. And there are really moments in this season where I have felt that I have been existing more than pursuing my purpose. I don't know about you, but there are times when you're, you're just existing. You're just filling the hours of the day. There is a famous cartoonist and a famous artist by the name of Richard Barton. And he took his life in 1931, and, and, and it, was, it was a completely shocking moment. N not just for the sake of a man committing suicide, but, but the fact that this man was successful and wealthy. He knew that people wouldn't understand why he had taken his life prematurely. And so he left a note pinned to his pillow, giving explanation, and it said this. I've had few difficulties, many friends, great successes. I've gone from wife to wife, house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I am fed up with inventing devices to fill the 24 hours of the day. Uh, friends, I, I want you to know that there are times I feel like I'm just trying to fill the 24 hours. W work's now done and now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're trying to fill the hours, trying to find some kind of pleasure, J just trying to find something that, that can justify us wasting the remaining hours before bedtime. You see, when we don't have purpose, we will merely exist trying to find devices that will fill the 24 hours of our day. 
But when we discover our divine purpose, and I'm not just talking about the macro level, I'm talking about our divine purpose even for the season that we find ourselves in now. When we find our divine purpose for the season of life that we're in, we become transformed, eager to start each day. I want to look at Peter's life one more time. And and we're going to turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, to to see how Peter was transformed by discovering his divine purpose for his life. The Bible says this. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken in. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. It's interesting, last week we talked about how Peter had discovered a new identity, being called Peter instead of Simon. Uh, How he understood who, who God was calling him to be, the who, not the what. But in this story, we find that he discovers his divine purpose, the what, not the who. What does God want him to be? Discovering his purpose is so transformative that we'll see that Peter is willing to leave everything. He is willing to leave his business because he has discovered the what that God has for him. But, friends, I want you to know that purpose is not always discovered in one moment. Our purpose often has moments of transformative discovery along the way. And so I want to look at some of the key moments for Peter in discovering his purpose. The first thing I think that Peter discovers is that God wants what you have. God wants what you have. You see, Jesus is is walking along, and he's talking to a group of people and teaching them. And what's so interesting in this, this story, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but what's so interesting is that we never ever find out what Jesus is teaching the crowd, because that's not what's important to Luke. What's important to Luke is what's about to take place in, in Peter's life. But nevertheless, Jesus is walking along teaching a crowd, and the crowd starts to get to a certain size. And Jesus looks around and tries to figure out how he's going to optimize the moment, how he's, how he's going to maximize the moment, what, what he's going to, to do to make sure that he can best communicate to everybody. He sees the two boats. And the Bible tells us that Jesus asks Peter if he could put the boat out a little bit so that he can teach from it. He actually gets into Peter's boat. I I don't know, as I read the story, I was picturing it. Jesus actually gets into Peter's boat as Peter's cleaning the net, and then he's like, hey, could you you actually push me out a little bit? Here's the thing that I discovered from this story. Jesus doesn't need Peter's boat. Jesus is the Son of God, and he can figure out whatever means he needs to accomplish this task of teaching. But Jesus wants Peter's boat. Friends, this is so important. God can always accomplish his purposes— for the kingdom, without what you have. He doesn't need what's in your hand. He doesn't need you. Now, that doesn't absent you from from his purposes. But just because he doesn't need your resources, just because he doesn't need your giftings, doesn't mean he doesn't want them. You see, God wants you to join him in fulfilling the purposes that he has by using what's in your hands for his kingdom. Let, let, me, let me just tell you this, that each of us has different things that God wants to use. Each of us has something that God's given us that he wants for his purposes. For Peter, it was a boat. For Moses, it was a staff, something that, that he just used to get around the, the, the wilderness. And God wanted to use that in a supernatural way, not just to set the people of Israel free from Egypt, but, but even post-exodus. We, we see that with David, he wants to use a slingshot to defeat a Philistine 
enemy. We, we see that with Samson, he wants to use a jawbone. With Paul, he wants to use conversational skills. With Lydia, he wants to use her garment dyeing business for the kingdom to produce some money to help, f- to, to help support the ministry that was there. For Philip, he wants to use his administrative skills. And for Barnabas, he wants to use this inert, the, 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 this, this inner uh, quality of his life of encouragement. God sees different things in each person, and he wants those things for his kingdom. I want to tell you something. The the beginning of the discovery of your divine purpose starts with recognizing we have something that he wants. I I read a humorous story this week uh, uh, about a lady, an elderly lady who had just been shopping in a grocery store. She was carrying her bags towards her car, and when she got to her car, her heart started to pound furiously because she looked into her car and she saw four men sitting there, two in the front and two in the back. To everyone's surprise, she put down the groceries, reached into her purse, and pulled out a gun. And here, Granny holds the gun at the the four men and starts screaming, Get out of my car! Get out of my car! Screaming at the top of her her lungs. The uh, the four men are so in shock and in such panic that they immediately unfasten their seatbelts, open the doors, and she holds the gun as they start to run. Get away from me! Get away from me! And they take off. Granny picks up the groceries. Puts the, gun, puts the gun back in her purse first, picks up the groceries, and enters and sits in the car. She goes to pull out her keys, and as she looks at the dashboard, something hits her. Not, not physically, but mentally. She realizes this isn't her car. Feeling quite embarrassed, she grabs her bags, goes through the parking lot, finds her car, puts, puts the key in the ignition, and drives straight to the police station to turn herself in. She begins to tell the police officer what she did, and the police officer is holding back his laughter. And, and she, she can see it, and so he turns to her and says, just look over there, those four guys are reporting a lady who had held up a gun to kick them out of their car, and, and just holding back the laughter because of the, the craziness of the situation. This lady was telling people to get away from what didn't even belong to her. She was claiming rights to something that wasn't even hers. And friends, that can be our posture with God, is that we have things in our hands that God wants to use, and we say, God, get away. This is mine. And God's going, wait a minute, but this is my car. This is my staff. This is my boat. This is my administrative skills. This is my, these are my finances. These things belong to me, and you're holding me at gunpoint, telling me this belongs to you, when truly it belongs to me. You see, too often we fail to recognize that we are treating what is not ours like it was. God wants what is really his in the first place. And for every single one of you, regardless of what you have, whether it's great or small, there's something that you have that he wants. Second thing that I think Peter has to discover is that God qualifies what we disqualify. He qualifies what we disqualify. Jesus says to Peter, as they're in the boat, hey, I'd like you to cast your nets into the deep water. Peter may have been jarred by Jesus' statement because Jesus had just been teaching on the kingdom, on on the great things of God. And Jesus takes a pause in in his sermon and just like, hey, by the way, why don't you take your nets and throw them into the deep water? Now, there were three types of nets that were used in those days. And the type of net that Jesus talks about in this moment. It is a net that's used at nighttime that would be cast into the deepest of water that would go down deep and collect fish. And Peter is shocked by Jesus' statement. He says these words, but we've fished all night and caught nothing. I've tried to wrestle with what's going on in Peter's mind at the moment. Let let me tell you what I think was going on in his mind. The first of all, Peter's thinking, hey, Jesus, you know what? I just want you to know that you're a carpenter, and I'm a fisherman, and so carpenters don't usually tell fishermen how to fish. Number two, I want you to know that we fished all night long, that we, that we put every effort and did everything we were supposed to do all night, and there just aren't fish available right now. And I want you to know, Jesus, that it's daytime. And you don't fish in the daytime because fish can see the nets. And if we throw the net out, there are going to be no fish that will come into our nets. Jesus, this doesn't make sense. And and mentally, Peter disqualifies the idea. He rules this out as being a good idea. Jesus, we should not do this. This is disqualified from all the possible good ideas out there. Disqualifies it mentally. Friends, I don't know about you, but so often in my life, when Jesus asked me to do something, 
I disqualify myself from doing it. I, I, I will look at my failures and say, Jesus, you can't use me. You can't ask me to do this because I've failed so many times. I've fished all night with no success. I've done this and this and no success. But God, this part of me, and I will disqualify myself because of my failures. Or I will disqualify myself because rationally it doesn't make sense. God, you've got to use somebody else. God, you've got, you got to choose somebody else. God, God th- this rationally doesn't make any sense. God wants to do abundant things in our lives, but we disqualify ourselves before he can even use us. There, there's an interesting story that Philip Yancey talks, t- tells. He, he was one time visiting a community in Lancashire, Lancashire uh, Pennsylvania. Let me try that again. He, he was visiting a, a community in Lancashire. I don't even know how you say that word, friends, but he was in Pennsylvania, and he had dinner at an Amish home. He was listening to the, the, the various people talk about their community, and he became quite intrigued about the pastoral presence within the community. And so he asked, hey, how do you select a pastor in an Amish community? They said, well, it's very interesting because most of our men, who, who are the only ones who are allowed to qualify for pastoral ministry in this context, they don't have grade eight education, and they barely have any theological education. So what we do is we ask the congregation to vote for who they think has the greatest pastoral gifts. And if an individual receives three three or more gifts, they are invited to a dinner. When they come to the dinner, there are hymn books that have been placed around the various settings of the table, and it randomly selected, there is one hymn book that has the note, congratulations, you're our new pastor. And they, the community said to them that, that nobody knew who would receive the hymn book because they all got to sit wherever they wanted. Philip Yancey was quite intrigued by this, and, and then he asked this vital question. He said, but, but what happens if the individual who sits down and opens up the hymn book and finds this piece of paper that says, you are our new pastor, what if that person doesn't feel qualified? And the person he had been talking to said, oh, that, that's really easy. If he didn't feel, if he felt qualified, we wouldn't want him. If he felt qualified, we wouldn't want them. You see, if, if an individual feels so qualified for something, that, then it's hard to actually see God's hand in it. If fishing at this time of the day with the deep nets made complete sense, and Peter put the net into the water and pulled it up, it wouldn't have been a miracle. It didn't require God. If rationally this made sense, then th- there would be a disconnect between the act and God's involvement. But when things don't make sense, when God asks us to be involved and we don't feel qualified, it's a moment for a miracle. You see, when we feel disqualified, it allows God to show off in our circumstance. God always uses the disqualified. It's a chance for him to show his abundance, his miraculous power through our lives. And so God will always use the disqualified. He used Jacob the deceiver. He used Moses the stutterer. He used Rahab the prostitute. He used Samson the womanizer. He used Gideon the scaredy cat. He used John the locust eater. He always chose people who didn't feel qualified. And friends, you may be sitting there today going, I, I, I have ignored some of the promptings of God. I have not got involved in some area of purpose because I haven't felt qualified. I'm here today to tell you that God qualifies those who feel disqualified. The last thing I want to point out is this. God calls without clarity. He calls without clarity. And most of us will never commit to something unless we have all the information. We want to know all the details about something before we ever say yes. So the story. The, there's this this moment where Peter obeys Jesus. Hey, Jesus, because you said so, because you're the Messiah. And he puts his net into the water, and he counts one, two, three, and he's expecting for the nets to come up easily. But as he says three, he pulls the net, and and there's this, this tug downward because the nets are full of fish. And they begin to pull the fish into the boat, and the boat is completely full of fish, so much so that the boat looks like it's about to sink, that they have to call for another boat. And I don't know about you, but in those moments, I would be saying, Jesus, I need you to join my business. I need you to join the fishing business because you can pull off things that we can't. That's not Peter's response. As soon as that happens, he says, Jesus, get away from me. I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. He, he, he uses this word of telling Jesus to, to flee, that, that he, he is so concerned that he is unworthy. He doesn't want to be around someone holy. And what does Jesus respond back to him with? 
Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch fish. He doesn't even address the fact that Peter is feeling unworthy. But he does address his fear. Fear is our natural response for self-preservation. It occurs when we are unsure of something. In, In this moment, Peter is afraid because he feels unsafe. He feels that he's unholy, and Jesus is holy. And he's not sure how a holy Messiah can hang out with an un- unholy person. And so this lack of safety, th- th- this lack of, uh, of un- uncertainty, or th- this great uncertainty that's in his life makes him afraid. And Jesus responds to Peter without addressing Peter's uncertainties. And then he provides another uncertainty. Not only does he not respond to Peter saying that he doesn't feel worthy, he provides one more uncertainty for Peter's life. He says, hey, Peter, from now on, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He actually uses this phrase, you're going to catch live people. It doesn't make any sense. Jesus provides no clarity for Peter, just a calling. And friends, I want you to know something. Jesus doesn't feel compelled to explain. He doesn't feel compelled to explain to Peter how he can use somebody who's unholy. He doesn't feel compelled to explain to Peter what it means to catch fish. All he feels compelled to do is to call him to a purpose. If you seek clarity before you pursue God's purposes, you will always remain stuck in a place of merely existing. You see, friends, you, we, we so desperately want clarity, but God doesn't always provide it. And when we make that the condition before we advance, we will always be stuck. There's an interesting story of Jeremy and Jessica Courtney, two, two brilliant individuals who were living in Texas uh, around the time where, where 911 took place, September 11th. In that moment, that, that, that earth-shattering pivotal point, the United States began to ask themselves how they should respond to those who had done such devastation to the country. The majority of people, including those in the, in the location where the, the Courtney's lived, said, we need to respond back in retaliation. We need to go after those who brought destruction to our country. And so for so many, that was the response. Here was this grad couple, newly married, that had many great opportunities before them, and they began to wrestle out what their response to the people who had done this should be. The more they, they wrestled, they start to ask questions like, well, who, should, who should we become? What does God want from us? And in their process of trying to understand the best response, they felt this nudge by God to not just connect with people from the Middle East, but to actually move there. It was a radical prompting from the Spirit. They, they had no clarity. They didn't know what the plan was. They, they weren't going to a church. They, they weren't going to be missionaries. They just felt that, they were by, that God wanted them to move to the Middle East and build relationships. So without clarity, without a, a understanding, with great uncertainty, they moved their family to the Middle East. And they just started to build relationships with people. The more they built relationships, they began to discover that there were people in some significant need, especially young children. And many of the children were requiring some hospital attention that wasn't provided for them. And so the Courtney's started a charity called Preemptive Love. And they began to find ways to help children in, with, in, with dire medical needs. And, and they began to bless the community. And, and friends, they would go through some terrible moments. They would go through some great persecution and and even their lives on the line. But they continued to minister to people out of this charity called Preemptive Love to bring an incredible change to that area of the world. You see, they had no clarity, just a nudge from the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want you to know something. We celebrate stories like this, but we forget that every story begins with an unknown. God does the great without ever explaining the details. So here's my question to you. What's God asking you that you want clarity on, but he hasn't given it to you? What's he asking you to do? You'd say, well, pastor, we're in this COVID-19 situation. There's, there's really no, no purpose that he has for me. Or maybe, hey, I'm, I'm at an older place in my life and, and I, I've served my purpose. I'm here today to tell you that God has a purpose for us in every season at every age. There is a divine purpose for our lives and he's asking us to grab hold of something even though there may be uncertainty. So Jesus says to Peter, 
I will make you a fisher of men. And Peter's response is so unique. He hears the purpose that Jesus has for him. He knows there's no clarity on this purpose. He doesn't feel qualified. And he knows that he has something that Jesus wants. And what does Peter do? He sells everything and commits his life to following Jesus. You see, he finds his divine purpose and he's willing to sell it all. Here's my question for you today. What is the purpose that God has for you? What, what's beyond, what does God have for you that's beyond just existing today? Fr friends, it, you might say, I, I'm older or, or I'm in this COVID-19 situation and there, there's really no purpose in this moment. Maybe when we get back to church, maybe when we get back to things as normal. But friends, I'm here today to tell you that God is calling you at every age, in every circumstance, in every season of your life to do something for him. To take what's in your hand, to take what's in your life, to connect it to his purposes and see your life become invigorated, wanting to wake up in the morning because you have been so transformed by a recognition of the purpose of God. Every one of you, God has a divine purpose. I'm going to ask that you'd bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. You're watching online and, and you're having trouble to even grab hold of this idea of God's divine purpose because you've never given your life to Jesus. And, and that might make complete sense because you see, friends, committing your life to Jesus is about committing to being loyal to Jesus, to pledging your allegiance to him, saying from this day forward, I give myself completely to him. He is my savior. He died for me. He needs to clean my sins and I pledge full allegiance. But you're provoked in your spirit and maybe you have been for some time. And if you are, I want you to just listen to this prayer and just in your mind and in your heart say, God, yeah, that's what I want. So listen to this prayer. And if it's what's in your heart, agree with me. Dear Jesus, today I need you to come into my life. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. I pray that, that you would wash me and be my Savior. And today I pledge allegiance to you for the first time. I want you to be in charge of my life. Because I know that if you're in charge of my life, you give me identity and you give me purpose. And so today, Jesus, I make you my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said, well, I was praying that prayer, yes, yes, yes. That's my prayer too, God. I'm encouraging you to just text the number that's on the screen. Let us know and we, that you made this decision today and we'd love to give you something. For the rest of you, I want to take a moment to pray. God has a purpose for you. It is something to transform your life, to move you from, from merely existence, merely filling the 24 hours of the day to a place where you can be energized by God. So let me pray with you. God, I pray today that you would give us a sense of purpose, that regardless of our age, regardless of our circumstances, that we would know the what, what you're asking for us. Because God, when we find the what, when we know the divine purpose, we come to understand what each day is about. And God, I pray that we would say yes, even without clarity. I pray we'd say yes, even when, when we don't feel qualified. I pray we would say yes to whatever you're asking of us, whatever you want. Let us say yes, because when we say yes to Jesus, we discover purpose, and every day becomes meaningful. So God, I pray, let us be transformed by your purposes, by the things you want to do through our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hope you have a great Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are so glad that you tuned in with us to hear another message from the Transformation Series. Hey, if you have any questions about faith or prayer requests, we encourage you to text this number and we would love to hear from you. Have an amazing week. We love you. We're praying for you. See you next week.